So my name's Arthur, and I work on the Cloud Gateway team at Netflix. And our primary responsibility is building and maintaining Zool. And Zool primarily routes traffic to all of our microservices. And we have a lot of microservices. You may have seen this picture before. This is a map of our streaming-related microservices. So only the streaming-related microservices, not all the other stuff we do. And this is the flow of traffic among them. So it comes from the internet through the ELBs, goes through multiple Zool clusters. Those Zool clusters route traffic to our backend services, mainly our API, and then to our mid-tiers. And you'll hear, me, you'll hear me use the word origin a lot. And origin essentially is our terminology for downstream service. So when I say origin, that's what I'm talking about. The service that Zool is going to route to. So this is pretty impressive, right? Here's the thing, though. This picture is actually several years old. Since then, some major services have been you know, sharded and decomposed into smaller ones. There are also more business functions and product features that we've added, and, and that creates you know, more new services. We've also started using containers. And this is great for developers. It makes it really easy to spin up a new service and do something new. Um, but for every container, every environment, every different configuration, this creates a new route for Zool. And very quickly, the system starts looking more like this. So over time, the amount of backends that Zool talks to has exploded. And it'll probably continue to do so in the future. Now, it's important to keep in mind that each one of these dots is a service. So it could be composed of potentially hundreds of instances and dozens of critical metrics that we, we may need to sift through just to see what's going on. So when we inevitably run into production incidents, we need to root cause them as fast as possible. When we had just a handful of origins, it was mostly doable. But now, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. We have to sift through dozens and dozens of dashboards to figure out what's going on and where. So imagine getting a page at 3 in the morning. You roll over. You grab your laptop. And you try and find that one needle in this massive, massive haystack. Not easy, right? It's pretty clear to us that we needed a solution to help us root cause these incidents more effectively. We've always had alerts based on static, percentage-based metric thresholds. And the problem with these alerts is that they're broad, and the thresholds are set very high so that we don't get a lot of false positives. So you may not catch certain anomalies that are very specific to your service or just too low to hit that threshold. They're also slow. Because they have to go through this huge time series database that serves the whole company, you may not get your alert until 10 minutes later like in this graph. So you can see the threshold gets crossed, and then only 10 minutes later we get an alert. So a lot of stuff can happen in 10 minutes, especially when you're dealing with massive scale. Another problem is these alerts would only be specific to our service. So we'd only get alerts for Zool and not for other services that may be having trouble. And since we're in the front door, we'd be getting alerts for everyone's services. Error rates go up for downstreams, error rates go up for us. So an example here, the top graph and the bottom graph are identical. One is Zool's error rate, the other one is a specific origin's error rate. You look at the dashboard, you know, five, 10 minutes, you figure out pretty quickly, okay, this is, this is the problem here. So this created an operational burden for us, and you know, we wanted to offload that. And what we ended up doing is building a real-time anomaly detection system. It has dynamic thresholds, and we run them for every metric and every grouping of different clusters and origins. And essentially, it creates this adaptive threshold that follows the metric. 
We then take all those anomaly detections across all of those slices, and when one of them is anomalous, we know exactly which origin is in trouble because we've sliced it by that origin or that Zool cluster to know what's going on. So then we compile all these anomalies into a timeline and send it out to the responsible or on-call operators. We named our anomaly detector Raju, and you know it's kind of a neat acronym, but realistically we named it after a former colleague whose name is Raju. And, uh, <laughs> He was famous at the company for like, being so in tune with every metric that he could like, just jump in and figure out what's going on. He was like, it's like he was living inside the computer. Um, so these alerts, they can pinpoint basically which system is in trouble when, create a timeline of events, and this creates kind of a causal relationship that helps us figure out which system is the root cause of all the problems. And we were blown away by the results we saw. So we've grown to rely on them pretty heavily, and it's significantly reduced our operational burden. For example, our team used to get 10 pages a week. Now we're down to about one page a week or less. So that's, that's a huge improvement for us. That's a massive win and uh, helps us sleep at night, you know, literally. And the other big win here is that it's in real time. So we can detect these alerts sometimes before our pages fire and sometimes before metrics show up on our dashboards. And we built all this without any fancy AI. There's no machine learning. It's just some elegant math, some statistics, and some algorithms that help us solve some very hard problems. So let's get into how we built it. First, I'm going to talk about why static alerts suck, why they didn't work for us how we use real-time event processing, and then how we use those real-time events to do anomaly detection, and then finally, how to filter out the anomalies that don't matter and make the alerts actually useful. So static alerts suck, and the biggest, the biggest thing we needed was speed. Speed is critical. Let me give you an example. We have a small incident and incident happens at zero minutes. So we have to wait for our metrics to catch up. Let's say we're five minutes in, and a pager fires. Somebody gets paged. Usually, it was Zool. So the Zool on call, you know, it might take them 10 minutes to get out of bed and get their laptop. They respond within 10 minutes. So we're already 15 minutes deep before we even looked at anything. Finally, if it's a, you know, if it's a minor incident, the Zool on call can dig through the metrics and you know, maybe they can figure it out in 15 minutes. And then they realize that it's actually a downstream system that didn't get paged because we didn't have that visibility. So now the Zool on call has to page the downstream on call. Again, we have to wait for the downstream on call to respond. Then they look through some metrics. If it, they're really lucky, they can identify that issue in 10 minutes. And then if they're even luckier, if it's like a config change, they can fix it in five minutes. So this best case scenario still takes about 50 minutes to resolve. And the first 30 minutes of that is just figuring out who to page. This is, this is very problematic. Speed when resolving this, this, these incidents is very critical. So most metrics co collection solutions, like time series databases, they're solving a very comprehensive problem for the whole company, and they tend to be pretty slow. For example, at Netflix, we're processing like a billion metrics per minute. And what we want to look at is a much narrower slice than that in a much faster way. So when these events happen, it takes at least five to 10 minutes for those metrics to catch up. We also use rolling counts on our alarms, or sorry, our alerts, uh, so that we don't get false positives. So for example, you want to see that you've passed that threshold nine out of the last 10 minutes before you send an email, so you're not constantly emailing people for like minor blips. And then each time you page another team, you create that loop. So if you have to page several teams in that investigation, it's going to take a very long time to figure out the root cause. And all these things put together mean we have much slower resolutions, which has a massive, massive impact. This is a graph 
of essentially extrapolated impact of incidents over time. So when we built a lot of these systems, let's say five years ago, we could have a two-hour outage, which today would be equivalent to a five-minute outage. So a lot of these tools aren't really solving the problems that we're having today, and we're actually trending even further. So a five-minute impact is just as big as a two-hour outage five years ago. That's, that's insane, right? And maybe in 10 years, it'll be like one minute or 30 seconds or whatever. But let's, let's not get ahead of ourselves. So obviously, over time, it's becoming more and more critical to resolve these incidents as fast as possible. The other thing we need is context. So alerts fire on a single metric for a single app that's set up by that specific team, and they don't really get to look at other teams' alerts. And typically, when an SRE sees that there's a huge outage, they'll page all the suspects. They'll page everyone that could potentially be involved so that they don't have to go through that loop of paging every downstream over and over again, which means that if you're the front door, like us, we get paged all the time. So we needed to show the what, the where, and the when in the alert so that the operators could orient themselves and figure out who needs to be paged. We also need accuracy. As I showed you in that previous graph, the, the static thresholds don't necessarily catch all the anomalies, and they're set for only these obvious high-impact issues that happen you know, at a very high scale, and that may not necessarily be enough. So we need more adaptive thresholds. And then selfishly for us, we wanted to reduce our operational burden. We were constantly getting paged, and that creates alert fatigue after a while. You have to go through all these dashboards when you get paged. And that created very difficult on-call rotations for us. And as I mentioned, our page load was about 10 a week, and we wanted to get that down. So what's the solution? Real-time alerting, combining several anomalies into one alert so we can see which, which systems are the pattern here, and then orient the operators so they can page the exact team and not every team. So let's talk about how we do real-time events. So for stream processing, we use a framework called Mantis. And Mantis is used essentially to collect and process real-time events. Um, you can think of it as like Kafka plus Apache Flink put together. And all the critical services at Netflix send events into Mantis, not just Zool. Um, to give you a sense of scale, just for Zool, we send millions of events per second across all, like, all the thousands of devices that we have. And each one of those events has hundreds of dimensions. So Mantis is incredibly useful for allowing us to kind of search and sift through those events and just pick out the slice that we need for all of our real-time traffic. And then we can do it on demand. So it doesn't necessarily need to push the events all the time. We can submit a query, and it'll just match the query and return the results. Here's how it works. So imagine we have all the Zool clusters, which are you know, hundreds and hundreds of instances. Um, we have a big Mantis job called the Mantis request source, and it opens an SSC socket to every single Zool instance. Then we have downstream jobs that want specific functionality, specific parts of that request source, so a certain subset. And they submit queries through the request source into Zool. Zool will find all the things that match, um, and then send that back to the request source, and the request source will multiplex it to all the jobs that are interested in that event. So some of the big features. Uh, the first one is querying. So you can submit SQL-style queries and get results back on that. You can sample any portion of traffic. So you could do 1% of traffic, 10%. You could do 100% if you want to. And aside from anomaly detection, this is an incredibly useful framework just for debugging production incidents. You can see exactly what a certain type of event looks like right now going through the servers. We also use Mantis for stream processing. So that Mantis job that's getting a stream of events, uh, 
can actually run some arbitrary code every time it gets an event. So you can think of it as like a mapping function. It also allows us to aggregate. So we can build complex result sets in real time. We can aggregate by any key in that highly dimensional space. And ultimately, allows us to reduce those large result sets into kind of useful aggregates. And then lastly, job chaining is very important. So we can take a bunch of these mapping functions, we can chain them together, we can pipe them into these reduce functions, and we can end up with a really, really useful result set um, and make some interesting decisions, which is what Raju does. So now for the good stuff. How do we do anomaly detection? We had some requirements. Uh, the biggest one, it needs to be cheap enough that we can do it in real time. It needs to be stable enough that we can, de we can detect sharp spikes and recover from them. And then still dynamic enough that it will adjust to new trends over time. And then lastly, we wanted to have it somewhat lenient so we don't get a lot of false positives. So we tried a handful of algorithms like double exponential smoothing. We tried historical analysis like week over week. But the solution we eventually came to uh, is median estimation. So the median is a robust indicator, which means it doesn't get skewed when there's a huge outlier. It stays very stable. Um, and it's, it's really cheap to calculate. Now, you might be wondering, how do you calculate a median on streaming data? You don't have the whole distribution. How do you get the median? Well, that brings me to our median estimation algorithm, or as I call it, the Cody algorithm, named after my colleague Cody because uh, he came up with it. <laughs> it's actually called uh, MAD, or Median Absolute uh, Deviation, I believe. Um, and it's effectively just a stochastic gradient descent with a static learning rate. So if a streaming value comes in and it's greater than our median estimate, then we increase our median estimate by one. If a streaming value comes in and it's less than our median estimate, then we decrease the median value by one. So very simple, very cheap, but surprisingly effective. Here's a, here's a graph from Raju, and the red line is the metric, and the blue line is the threshold, and you can see the metric is very noisy. It's going up and down, up and down, up and down, and the threshold is very stable, but it still follows along. So as that spiky metric goes up, the threshold slowly goes up, and as the spiky metric drops, the threshold slowly drops, but it's very stable. And that's because that learning rate is static, and it's it's one, so it's, it's learning very slowly, and, and, and that's, that's a big feature, because when you get this, which is very common for our outages, is metrics that go from zero to 1,000, or 8,000 in this case, that threshold doesn't overcorrect. It doesn't chase that error metric too fast, so it remains very stable, and eventually, when that error metric drops back down to zero, you can see that the threshold's not too far up and it can recover pretty quickly. Whereas with some other algorithms, it would go to from zero to 8,000 and now your threshold's like blown out for an hour. And then when it recovers, it's blown out for another hour because it's like negative now. So stability, big feature. It's also, it's also very simple, right? Which produces a simple code base and predictable behavior and again, very cheap to calculate over thousands and thousands of metrics and all these permutations of cluster origin and combinations. So that's, that's incredibly important. The other feature that we really wanted was recovery detection. Um, it's critical to see if an alert is ongoing or if it's transient, right? It's, if you wake up in the morning you don't necessarily want to get out of bed if this thing's recovered already, right? And if it recovers in a couple minutes, then you're probably okay to go back to sleep. Um, it also prevents action, right? If you know something's recovered, it's going to mitigate action without you having to figure out if it's recovered or not. So you're not going to have to go scale something up or scale something down or push a new build or whatever. And then it gives you some info, right? If it spiked and recovered quickly, that's information that's useful to figuring out what the problem is. And since we're building this timeline of events, we have this open window for anomalies, we could potentially recover before we've sent the email, in which case we don't need to send the email at all. 
How do we detect recovery? Well, it's pretty simple. We calculate the pre-alert range, which is our kind of stable metric. And then we look at the recent range, and we have to confidently be able to say that the recent range is the same distribution as the pre-alert range. And if that's true, then we've recovered. But again, this is harder than it sounds for streaming data because you don't have the entire set. You need to find a heuristic that's useful for figuring out what your boundary is. And what we did for that is we used the Hufting bound. And you should take a picture of this with your cell phones because this is extremely useful for streaming data. This is like a killer app for streaming data. Uh, you basically only have to give it the range, which is the max minus the min, and the set of numbers, the size of the data set that you have, and it will give you some boundary with a confidence of epsilon. So if you play with that delta, the one minus delta there, if you play with that delta, you can kind of tweak it for your metric and be fairly confident that your recent points are in the same distribution as your previous points. So here's an example. You can see there's a distribution in the bottom corner there. And depending on your delta, you're going to be either very close to that distribution or very far from that distribution. So you don't want to be too close because then you'll, you'll be not lenient enough. And you don't want to be too far because then you're going to overshoot your distribution and be way too lenient and everything is going to look like a recovery. Um, typically, we've been pretty happy with a delta of 0 0.1, which is that 99% line. Uh, and it's, it's worked very well for us. So what does a recovery algorithm look like? Uh, it's a Hufting bound on the pre-alert distribution. We then take the last 30 seconds of data points and get the mean. And then if the recent mean is below that bound, then we're good. We've recovered. Here's what it looks like on a graph. So usually the error rate is flat, and then something happens, error rate spikes. We have our pre-alert range. Now we're anomalous. And then it starts tapering off slowly. And depending what kind of algorithm you're using, like if you're calculating slope or something like that, you may think you've recovered at one of those two upper recovery ranges. But in reality, you haven't really recovered until you're back to that normal error rate that you're used to. So it's very effective in that sense. Now, these anomalies happen all the time. We don't want to get flooded with emails, right? We want to make sure we only get the emails that are real problems and have a real impact. So first, let's, uh, let's look at what Raju really looks like. So these boxes are the chain of Mantis jobs that compose Raju. And the size of the box corresponds roughly to how many uh, containers are required to run it. So the Zool request source is huge. It's hundreds of containers because it has to be able to handle potentially all of Zool's traffic. We then pipe it to an aggregator, so some aggregation query. And this can be a much smaller cluster, maybe tens of instances, and produce a distilled aggregate. Once we get that aggregate, then we can have like one instance uh, clusters, like the anomaly detector and Raju are very small because all they get is just aggregates. For the Zool aggregation, it's pretty simple. We select the status for all requests, and then we aggregate all the values of that status, and we group them by Zool cluster and destination origin. We then window it for 10 seconds, and we output it at a one second interval. So the groupings that we end up with are the Zool cluster, the downstream origin, and then cluster and origin together in case it's, it's a very specific type of issue. We then take those groupings and we feed them into that anomaly detector. And what it does is it flattens all of those groupings into a big list. Sorry. And uh, we take that big list and we run anomaly detection on each item in that list. So each item in that list is going to have some count. And then if one of those counts is anomalous, we know exactly what's broken. We know it's ex that exact permutation of cluster and origin that's in trouble. 
So recall this slide from earlier, right? This is, this is the representation of all the different permutations that we have. And when one of them has that anomalous metric, we know right away it's that guy. Here's, the, here's what the data looks like. This is, a, a, I think, a more useful, uh, like, this is, this is like the real explanation. This is, this is the money of what it looks like, right? So you have all these predictions coming in. And you can see it's color coded a little bit. So on the left, we have the Zool cluster uh, as the grouping. So it's all for the same cluster, but different values of status. So we have success, we have uh, read time out, we have throttling. And then on the right, we have different groupings, like Zool cluster 2, and then cluster and API put together, or just API. And when one of these is anomalous, we know that it's that cluster. We know it's like Zool cluster 1 has an anomalous count for this value. So we can say in the email, Zool cluster 1 is throttling traffic at this rate. That's essentially, you know, it's, it's almost like root cause detection, but it's, it's the very first step to that root cause detection. And, you know, this is, this is what makes it so powerful, this, this, this ability to dig down into all these aggregates. Now, most anomalies aren't really anomalies, right? They happen all the time, so we need to assess impact. We need to figure out, is it recovered or not, and essentially filter out all the noise. So the way we did that is with a rules engine. We open this window when the first anomaly happens, and we then collect all the subsequent anomalies for that window size. And at the end of the window, we run this rules engine for each anomaly. And this rules engine basically just tags every one of those anomalies with a bunch of useful data. Once we get all those tagged anomalies, we can then make an intelligent decision on what we should do, whether we should alert, we should not alert, things like that. So an example of some useful rules, uh, time, very important. When did the alert happen? When did the alert recover? Impact, also very important. If it doesn't impact any traffic, we don't care. If it has a really big impact, that's very important. So what percent of traffic is erroneous versus successful? A description, so when we send the email to operators, we don't necessarily have to expect them to know all of our status codes. We want to describe what the problem is. And then finally, decisions on do we alert, do we not alert, do we page, do we not page. And these rules are all handwritten, which is somewhat time consuming, but incredibly accurate. So as I mentioned, we have this timeline of events. When the first anomaly happens, we start a window. We close the window after three minutes. And then we end up with this tagged timeline. So it's a very rich timeline of events. And what it ends up doing is creating this time-based causation almost. Well, technically correlation. But the correlation is very strong because things are happening in a very tight window. So you can figure out pretty clearly what's going on. And we can look at some examples. This is what a Raju email looks like. I know you can't see anything on the slide. It's very dense. Um, so I'm going to clean it up for you guys. So I've kind of simplified and renamed a couple of the things so that you actually know what they say instead of like our internal Netflix names for things. Uh, in blue, we have the Zool cluster. In green, we have the downstream origin. Uh, in yellow slash orange, we have uh, the, failure, the failure status described, and then purple is the impact. So you can see the first thing that we get is this grouping of Zool cluster, so the Zool website cluster, and our API origin, and it's starting to have some connectivity issues. Connectivity issues meaning like we can't connect, we're getting connection refused. Next thing that happens is just that API service grouping is now failing with timeouts. And then a few seconds later, just the website grouping, the website cluster, is also failing with timeouts. Then it gets a little bit worse. Now Zool is throttling retries to that API service. And throttling retries essentially means we're trying to prevent a retry storm. So instead of sending all the traffic to this downstream origin and, and basically taking it underwater, we're rejecting anything that is tagged as a retry uh, to protect it. But this is a pretty dire situation. This means that people are probably not able to stream anything. 
at least for that cluster. And then a different Zool cluster, which is the API, Zool API cluster, uh, which generally fronts that API service as well, is now also throttling retries, so another retry storm. And then finally, just the cluster grouping is throttling. So it's pretty clear here that the root cause is somewhere in API, right? You have multiple Zool clusters having trouble talking to this API service, and the API service on its own is also in trouble. So even though in the past you would have potentially paged both Zool and API, in this case, it's pretty clear it's not a Zool problem. It's almost certainly an API problem. And th this, was, this was a powerful thing to see for us because we can now point to this, you know, this being the root cause and we can send that directly to that team. Um, in fact, it was, it was so successful that we wanted to dig a little bit deeper. And so we expanded Raju into API as well. Now, let's take a step back and talk about what API actually is at Netflix. Uh, it's called the API.next platform, if, if some of you are aware of that or not. Um, it's essentially an orchestration layer. So there are many device teams, and those device teams deploy their endpoints, which are basically groovy scripts for the most part, into this shared platform. And they use the platform code to do all kinds of stuff, all kinds of functionality that goes downstream to other services. And that code is always, whatever function that service is doing, whether it's making it downstream or not, is going to be wrapped in a Hysterix command. So those are the H's on that graph. Um, and Hysterix is essentially a framework for you know, short-circuiting and uh, isolating traffic. So it creates an isolation of all these functions so that they, so one bad function basically doesn't take down the entire server. Now, there's, there's so much functionality here. There's so much stuff that API does that you end up with hundreds and hundreds of these Hysterix commands. And you guessed it, it's another needle in a haystack problem. So this seemed like another natural place where we could put Raju. So what we did is we aggregated all the Hysterix response codes and we grouped them by the command name, so the actual functionality of that Hysterix command, and the API cluster that it was running on. And then we basically threw them onto the same timeline as all the Zool anomalies. So here's an example, again, cleaned up for your viewing pleasure. Uh, the, you can see there's now like a prefix on the line that says which app it came from. So it's either API or Zool. And uh, the API cluster is coded blue, and then the Hysterix command is coded, uh, or sorry, colored green. So let's go through it. We have this incident, and the first thing that happens is this grouping of API service, which is that API origin, and this authenticate customer command is suddenly failing. And then just the authenticate customer command is failing, which means it's probably happening across multiple clusters. You wait a couple minutes, and eventually it escalates into Zool failing with read timeouts. Uh, and it's Zool API, which is the cluster fronting API and the API origin. So again, pretty clear indicator where the problem is. And then the website cluster and the website UI service start failing. Um, and this is because that website UI service has to make some calls to API in order to render the website. Uh, start throttling requests, failing with read timeouts. And then a related Hysterix command starts failing, which is get customer permissions. So in this case, authenticate customer get customer permissions all go to the same origin, the downstream of API, which is our subscriber service that holds all of that information. And then finally, the Zool API cluster across the board is, is saying, no more retries. We're throttling this retry storm. So this is problematic. But you can see how powerful this is, right? Not only do we know that the issue is happening in API, but we know exactly which slice of functionality in the API is broken. So we know that, OK, most likely, our subscriber service is in trouble. So the operators or the SREs see this kind of email, and they're not going to page Zool, and they're not going to page API, probably, 
they're going to page the subscriber team. So huge win, huge win for us. And on top of that, it's pretty clear that, you know, what the root cause is here, right? You can see the root cause pretty, pretty, pretty easily just by looking at this timeline of events. So we didn't stop there. We expanded, uh, we expanded to other types of events. So events that aren't anomalies, but that we can see happening. Now, our gold standard metric for KPI, so our, our gold standard indicator of is the system good or not is the start play indicator. So how many start plays are we getting per second? If you can't play, that means we're in trouble, right? If you can't push play and play a video, that means we're, we're down, most likely, because it's, it's a very predictable cycle of, of our traffic. So in this example, one of our DRM services, uh, which is the Play Ready DRM, uh, it's typically used for Windows and streaming sticks. You can see that Hystrix command starts failing, and then within about a minute, we get this SPS drop event for the Windows app and the streaming stick. Now, this is, this is mind-blowing to us, right? This is, this is like insanely powerful. You're getting this SPS drop event, which we've, we've had for years and years, but you're not only getting this SPS drop event, you're also getting what caused the drop, right? So before you'd say, okay, well, Windows is down, let's figure it out. Now you're saying, okay, Windows is down and it's because the DRM service is broken. Here's another example. So this one is Zool instead of API. Um, but basically we have this Zool cluster that fronts our, a lot of our production traffic. And in this case, it's fronting the iOS UI service and services in trouble, and then again, within about a minute, iPhone, iPod, and iPad get an SBS drop. So you're getting this SBS drop event for iOS devices, and guess what? The iOS service is in trouble. Let's page those guys. We took it another step further. <laughs> uh, we added Spinnaker events, and Spinnaker is our kind of deployment framework. So in this particular example, again, you see it's not an SPS drop, but it's a push. So somebody pushes a service, and then the Hystrix command for that service breaks a minute later. So you get this email, and you can pretty quickly, as the operator, say, okay, let's roll back that push. It's obviously broken. And then finally, you know, we have all this functionality now, but we don't want to get those pages. We don't want to get those emails. So we start actually emailing the culprits directly. Um, the origins sometimes aren't aware of the issue. If it's a connectivity issue, they may not even see it in their metrics. So this gives them much better visibility into whether their service is in trouble or not. And then obviously, if it recovers, we'll send them a follow-up with, uh, with recovery info. So this ultimately reduced the need for us to get paged on everything, and, uh, and it kind of pushes the onus onto the teams that own the services that are in trouble. So, the elephant in the room, machine learning, right? Any, for any Black Mirror fans. Uh, that's a crazy episode, by the way. <laughs> uh, so why didn't we use machine learning? Well, for this particular problem, it wouldn't have worked well, right? It's very hard to train something when you have very few examples of, of problems, right? We don't have that many outages that we can train this effectively. And when we do have outages, they're all different. They don't, we, we don't have outages because the same thing keeps happening over and over again. So it's very hard to train a reinforcement type model. And because of that, you'll have this huge false positive rate. Um, and then the other problem is even if you could get half of the way there, the data set will then change. And so whatever you've trained is now useless because things don't look the same after like a month or two months. Things are always evolving and looking different. So some of the benefits are, you know, we get the simple, predictable code base. We have these handwritten rules, which have this really high true positive rate. And that's super, super important when you're dealing with thousands and thousands of metrics and all these different clusters and all these different permutations. If you had a high false positive rate, you would never look at those alerts. You'd be getting like 100 a second, right? It's not useful. So that high true positive rate is very important. But obviously, you know, there's trade-offs there. It's not necessarily easy to transfer a new service into Raju. There's a lot of hand-holding that has to happen. Um, the rules need to be created manually, as I mentioned. 
Uh, the alerting decisions are potentially different for every service, so those may need to be tweaked every time you add a new service. And then in order to do all that stuff, you need deep operational knowledge, and that comes at a premium. So, you know, pros and cons, but we're pretty happy with it. We built this real-time contextual alerting system over thousands of metrics, millions of events per second. They go off super fast, and they sometimes even recover before our pagers fire. And they give us this rich timeline of events that gives us deep insight into our system and essentially help us root cause a lot of incidents. We've also expanded into API and other services you know, for deeper insights, and we continue to do that. And we're going to continue to expand Raju and make it more user friendly to hopefully help onboarding and things like that. And ultimately, we did it in a very simple way without any AI and pretty happy with it. That's it. Thank you.